very happy to to have you. Um, this is the third time that we're doing an online conversation with uh, Learning Collaborative Farm to School. Um, today we're going to be uh, discussing about a seasonal menu, and I know that for some of you, this this is one of the topics that you um, request. And for the new people who are joining for the first time, thank you so much. I want to um, uh, say. Thank you and kudos to the farm school ambassadors who are present here today. And to talk a little bit more about what is farm to school and value change and how SFC Sustainable Food Center is connected with this event, I'm gonna pass back to Hali, who is our uh, value change director. Thank you, Saidi. Um, yeah, so my name's Hallie, like I said earlier, I'm the value chain director at Sustainable Food Center, so I support our team that leads our farm to school and farm to institution work. Um, for more about what SFC is, for some background on what we do, we're based in Austin, we've been working for about two decades to transform the food system to nourish our health, land and livelihood here in Texas. We envision a just, equitable and regenerative food system where people in the environment thrive, and this event today is part of our work supporting Texas schools, localizing their food supply chains to really ensure healthy and sustainable school food in their communities. We're really thrilled to be partnering with the Texas Department of Agriculture's Farm Fresh program to expand farm fresh food across Texas and schools. Texas Farm Fresh um, is part of TDA and it connects local schools with Texas agriculture. The movement was started by the TDA commissioner, Sid Miller, to cultivate, excuse me, to cultivate an enduring mindset among new generations in which, sorry y'all, um, in which foods are chosen with the knowledge that those choices positively impact not only their health, but also the health of the community at large. So this today event is a part of a collaboration between SFC and the Department of Agriculture's Farm Fresh work. Um, it's currently funded by a USDA Farm to School grant, although that grant's coming to an end. So we're doing some planning about how we want to continue to hold these spaces, which we're really excited about. Um, and this is part of a space that we're cultivating called the Texas Farm to School Learning Collaborative, which is a space where Texas school nutrition professionals and other farm to school practitioners um, that are implementing farm to school programming and buying farm fresh foods can connect um, share expertise and support each other in really building a, a movement here in Texas. So we're really excited to have everyone here today and especially excited to have our speakers. So I'll pass it back to Saidi to in, uh, introduce our speakers today. So again, thank you so much for making the time to be here with us today. Uh, we are always looking to hear from you and to uh, put together uh, initiatives that make sense with, with your interest. interest. Um, today, um, we're going to talk about uh, seasonal men menu plan planning, and for that, I, uh, we're here with Lillian Barnett uh, with the Florence ISD um, and also Michael Mosley um, with the Texas Department of Agric Agriculture. So I want to welcome and say thank you so much for being here today uh, and volunteer to, to do this work with us. Uh, so Lillian and Michael. I'm going to introduce Lillian first. Um, so Lillian <clears throat> is a cattle rancher, hay producer, and for the uh, last 17 years has served in the Child Nutrition Director for Florence ISD. Prior joining a uh, school food service, uh, Lillian worked as a deli manager at HEB and uh, Chile is starting a service as Ultima becoming the general manager. We know that Lillian is very passionate about uh, local food and she has been um, collab collaborating with SFC and we have a lot of respect of your work, Lillian. So thank you so much for being here today and thank you for willing to share your work. Um, and then we're going to have Michael mostly uh, serves as a food systems and program engagement specialist for the Texas Department of Agriculture. And he works across program advancement, summer meal programs, and the TDA Farm Fresh Initiative. Before joining TDA, Michael was the wholesale manager at Johnson's Backyard Jack Garden. Uh, for probably from people who are from Central Texas, you know maybe about Johnson's Backyard, backyard Garden. 
And uh, this was a 200, it is a 200 acre organic vegetable farm in Austin. And just to mention, it was one of the of the groups who really make a farm to school more available and achievable in the, in the Austin ISD here. Uh, both the speakers will present uh, will uh, present um, their their ideas, and after after that, we will have a question and answer. And we always encourage you to be interactive as as much as we can. So if you have a comment or a question or something, you can definitely use the chat and and bring the attention of the speakers. Um, with that, I want to say, please, uh, Lillian, join us with your presentation. Sorry, my picture kept moving. I couldn't unmute myself. Hi, everybody. I'm Lillian Barnett, Job Nutrition Director at Flora. Can you all hear me okay, Holly? Okay. Um, so imagine my surprise when they ask me to share everything I know because I feel like I don't know a whole lot of anything, but like I'm still learning every day. Um, but I went ahead and put a little um, presentation together, just kind of how um, we approached it here at Florence. Um, we're up to about 26% local food purchases now, and we've been able to accomplish that um, a lot with the help um, of S, uh, SFC. Um, they have some great people that help to pull some tools together, um, uh, some tracking forms and that sort of thing. Um, and we once we started tracking local, we realized that we were really already doing a lot of local. Holly, are you pushing my buttons? Okay. <laughs> so we just um, really tried to start small. We are lucky we're we're here um, north of Georgetown, about an hour north of Austin. So we're kind of in agri agricultural country anyway. Um, our, our very first step, um, we kind of jumped the gun a little bit and we already have made some relationships with some farmers. We work with, um, Ben McConnell out at Bolden Food Forest and he's in Rogers, Texas, and he is an organic, um, permaculture farmer. And he actually approached us, um, and Temple ISD about, um, providing schools with some of his products. Um, he is really going gangbusters with the farmer market, farmers markets now. So we're not getting um, as much of his product as we would like to. Um, but I know that he is expanding at a fast rate. So we're hoping to get back with him. Um, Holly, if you want to go on to the next slide. So one of the first things that we did. Oh, I'm the host now. Okay. So one of the first things that we did was. Um, I don't even see the presentation anymore. Sorry, y'all. When the tech host has tech issues, I'm going to oh, share my screen again. I it was me. Okay. <laughs> no, that was me. So, um, when we started working with Hallie and all them at um, Sustainable Food Center, that's when Mia Berger set us up with this cool tracking tool. Um, and so what we do basically every week is we take our invoices and we break them down between local um, and not local so we can track the exact percentages that we're doing. And we've noticed our percentages are definitely going up. But one of the interesting th things we found was that we're already just by virtue of being part of the Texas 20 and Labatt and some of the contracted items, we're already getting a lot of local product. Um, we found out that our honey was from Parasol the brown sugar and some of the white sugars are actually coming from Sugarland, Texas. Um, Texas spice out of Round Rock, Texas. We've got, um, you can see there that the corn chips that we use for like um, taco salads and nacho days and that sort of thing. Of course, the pickles. Um, and then I was really excited. My daughter went to school out at Texas Tech and we went to Palo Duro Canyon one time. And so when we're unloading the commodity truck one day, here comes all these cases of ground beef from Palo Duro Canyon. Um, so a lot of, of the uh, the brown box commodities are also coming from local here in Texas. And then of course, Kurtz, I don't know if, uh, who all's using their bread, but it's great bread. They also supply people like um, HEB, um, and those sort of things. So um, just my advice would be just to look, you know, ha start having your staff look at labels 
we really started doing that anyway because of the Buy American provision. Um, learned a lot about that too. So um, that's kind of that's kind of how we started and um, built that tracking tool. And so every week we just say this much dollars in local, this much dollars in non-local, and it just comes up with a percentage for us. So um, that would be my first recommendation. And then, um, you know, check with your vendors about other items that they might have that's local, because that's already easy, right? We've already gone through the through the bid process, and most of us work with a co-op or whatnot. So um, some of them, Labatt Produce does a really great job of sending us what they have in stock that's local. Um, the Favors um, DOD, um, they also put on, if you're participating there, they also put whether or not uh, items are local to Texas. Um, and then of course the food distribution program, you have the opportunity to um, divert some of your dollars to farm to school. And then from that, you can get, I think it's four or five items now. It's top of Texas apples, which are delicious, um, some pears, watermelons, all obviously all that's very seasonal. And then Brothers does do a pretty good job as well of, of keeping us updated on what's available and what's local. Um, and then, you know, visiting farmers markets is a great way to start conversations that um, for a lot of farmers are just like a lot of us and they don't really even know where to begin. So, um, so um, just kind of remembering that um, as far as menuing your items, you kind of have to be flexible because um, I know with cycle menus and whatnot, it's really easy to get in the habit of doing the same fruits and vegetables, but you can really get into cost problems if, you know, if you're trying to do strawberries in December or watermelons and you know, November and that sort of thing. So we really truly do use the um, the square meals tools, the seasonality wheels and, and that sort of thing. And I think that they'll talk about that a little more later. And being a cattle farmer and country girl, I love the farmer's almanac too, to tell us what's gonna happen. Um, market news, you can keep up with those through the TDA website. Um, uh, there's several ways to keep up with uh, uh, and actually, Labatt does a great job of that too. So if you're if you're experiencing floods in Florida or or fires in California, and you're not going to be getting your romaine, it'll give you the opportunity to um, kind of you know make some changes and adjust your menus, so forth. So, um, and then of course, if you still want to expand some more and start finding some local producers. Um, we already talked about Square Meals. Um, that's a great resource. Um, and I've actually talked to some local farmers that weren't even aware of that resource and, and encouraged them to sign up. And I think we have two or three here just from the Florence area that have just recently become members of the um, Farm Fresh Producers Group. Um, I, we talked about local farmers markets. Um, read the reading the grocery store labels. A lot of times you can find um, local products, especially in the produce section. Um, we just actually did a, a recipe testing for some local mushrooms, and those come right out of Gonzales, um, which is which is pretty cool. Um, that uh, we're able to bring those into the school now, and we were able to work with TDA on this big USDA grant, and it was it was kind of fun to do that. So. Um, talk to the food banks. The food bank can kind of tell you what local farmers, because uh, there's a lot of farmers that grow and they they are very um, they're very uh, generous with their their extras going to the food banks, um, and the food banks can tell you how to get in touch with them as well as well. And of course, the networking, the you know getting out there, meeting people um, when you when you find a school that's already working with a farmer, you know asking them to put you in touch with them and talking about their processes. Um, this is three of the local folks that we use right now um, that we've just kind of cultivated from Florence, not through any of the TDA programs or anything like that. So uh, Fifth Branch Farms, we're super excited about. You can see they just recently got started, but that's a woman-owned farm. They're going to be organic. And we already had a meeting. We're actually a little bit behind because we had a late frost we were going to shoot for right after spring break. But they're basically, they're going to do a lot of planting based on what we need and what we want. Um, they're also planting an orchard because um, fruit is one of the things that I would like to see more of. The vegetables are a little bit easier to get. So pretty excited about their orchard that they've got going in. 
And then Ben McConnell at Bolden Food Forest. If you haven't checked out his website, he's an amazing farmer. He is he is a really smart guy and really um, passionate about taking care of the land. Um, and he, he has in the past um, worked with TDA as well at some of the you know farm fresh networking things. And then LNS Farms, that is um, a, a local pecan grower, and they're about half capacity right now. They were impacted by the wildfires last year, but um, he, they, I, I think they saved about half of their pecan trees. And Bobby um, is the is the husband in that outfit, and he plants. He's a got a green thumb, and so he is able um, to bring us in. Uh, very seasonal things and his stuff starts rolling in um, usually when we start summer feeding so it's fun to have him come in and his products come in and um, and then feed that to the kids and come in, we kind of learn use that as a community engagement opportunity and a nutrition education opportunity um, and so, of course, you know, start small. You don't have to, especially big, bigger schools or what have you. We try to do um, harvest of the month items. We try to do daily samples and then add, you know, smaller quantities to salad bars instead of trying to, you know, fix 1,100 servings of turnips or something that we, you know, might end up throwing away a thousand of them. So um, we try to start small and just add them to where the kids don't really have to commit to things, especially things that they're not used to seeing. Um, the lettuce in this particular salad is from True Harvest Farms out of Belton. And if you haven't experimented with their product yet, it's amazing. Um, so they have a couple of great videos. They're working with a couple of, um, of the, of, of schools already and having good results. Kids are eating the salad up and it's really in, increased um, adult participation for us as well. If you haven't had these apples, you're missing out because these are the best apples ever. They're sweet and they're crisp and they're, um, they're the perfect size, not too big, not too small. And these apples, um, you can get them from the, through the DOD favors. Um, I'm trying to think if that was something that we could order post sale, but I can't remember right now. Um, so I think that that was DOD favors that we got those, but those are from Farwell, Texas, which if I'm not mistaken, is kind of up in the High Plains area. And then this is a True Harvest um, the lettuce, the way it comes packaged. I, I, I saw uh, the prepared, um, items a minute ago, but th it just comes in. It is so fresh. It is so beautiful. They don't guarantee anything, but we've had it in the walk-in cooler for up to two weeks, and it is just as beautiful as the day you brought it in. It's kind of still doesn't have the roots attached to it, but just barely. Um, it's clean. It's beautiful. It's um, hydroponically grown, so you you don't have quite like the dirt and that from romaine that is grown out in the fields. And um, working with the people at Chew Harvest has been great. They've got a lady out there named Lexi who will just bend over backwards to help you get her product into your schools. Um, she came and talked to our bilingual ESL um, family engagement night and, the, and those families were super excited to have her. So um, also we talked about the, te the Texas mushrooms from Gonzalez. So we are playing with those in all kinds of applications. The recipe that we just tested was a mushroom queso. Um, this is a house pickled mushroom that we put on the salad bar. Kids love that on their salads and they also like it for their pizzas. Um, and the nice thing about that is you can control the sodium because you're making it yourself. Um, and then these are how our pecans come from LNS Farms and they are just super sweet, super delicious and super fresh, so. A few more applications of how we use some of our farm fresh products. So um, we do this is a this strawberry feta. It's got blueberries because we couldn't pass on how good they looked. And then we do a candied pecan with the pecans that we get here locally and put it on top of that lettuce. Uh, the one in the back is just using the commodity ham. Um, so uh, those tomatoes are from Bolden Food Forest. He does all kinds of fancy tomatoes. So this was actually in our summer feeding program and we just did a nice um, tomato salad um, as a side option for the kids. 
Um, and of course, Texas oranges can't beat those. And those are my cows. So I had to throw a picture of them in there. Um, so just kind of going over what you have at your disposal. There's so much information on squaremeals.org. Um, like I said, TDA will be on in a minute and they'll probably walk you through that a little bit better. Uh, the Farm Fresh Network is awesome. Um, and the USDA Farm to School. One of the things that has helped us, that has helped us a lot with tracking our actual local is when you're signing up to do the Farm Fresh or the Turn Up the Beats or all those sorts of awards that we get accolades for, all the work is done for you because you're just tracking it every week. So um, was there another one? Yep, that's it. My, follow me for more recipes. And um, I have my contact information here. If I can help in any way, just let me know. Lillian, thank you so much. I mean, definitely, um, you know, you touch of so many uh, resources available here in Texas for other schools and also how brave you are and how positive you are, you know, to build those relationships. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm super excited about uh, delicious meals that you share and really like very clear examples and, um, you know, pictures and everything. I feel like this helps us, all of us to really cross sometimes that line about, oh no, do I need to start this? Or is this too complicated? Yes or no, is worth it? Definitely, it seems like, I mean, you enjoying every step of the process that you put together with your team. Thank you. So um, is it Hernan asked me to um, uh, talk about DOD and that is just that is another program that you can divert some of your um, your money to when you're getting brown box or diverting it to uh, further processing. There's a button you can push for DOD that you want to receive money and then what TDA does is they kind of do a fair share distribution with however much money they have. Um, but it's it'd be there when you start when you do your surveys for the following year each year. I don't know if it's too late to do that now this for next year or not, but um, if you want to email me, I can walk you through it. Okay, thank you so much, Lillian. Uh, we have the, the resource page. Uh, this is a live document that is available to anyone who is right now with us. Please feel free to populate that. And, and I invite everyone here to share resources. That's one of the intentions of this conversations. And uh, I would like to pass to Michael. Uh, thank you. And I want to say thank you to Lillian. Um, no, a few of you have probably seen me speak before. Normally, I'm on my soapbox about farm to school, but I get to speak about something a little different uh, today. And I also want to say, if you've never tried True Harvest uh, butter lettuce, go out and get you some. That's uh, that's so good. But anyway, I'm going to be talking about seasonal menu planning and some additional resources that we have here at TDA uh, that we put together for you. And also at the end, I'll even introduce some. Uh, resources from outside of TDA that you might find helpful. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This is just a um, little small recap of what I'm about to talk about. Uh, menu planning, uh, seasonality, uh, again, TDA resources, and then some outside resources. Next slide. Um, when you're putting together your menu, just like a restaurant, most people just see that piece of paper and this is what's being served but as we all know there's a lot of other factors to consider um, I would say child nutrition directors probably have even more to consider than a chef or anywhere when working in the restaurant side uh, if you could go to the next slide um, there's are going to a restaurant's going to mainly have to deal with costs and what they're charging you whether or not they're making profit but they don't really have to worry about how much sugar, salt, food groups, all that that they're serving you. That's up to you. But uh, C and D, you have a, the responsibilities of having your menus compliant and following the USDA meal patterns, um, the budgeting, the cost per meal, labor expenses, how that all 
all factors into your budget. Uh, equipment and personnel are definitely, depending on what type of kitchen you're running, whether you're just uh, buying things that are pre-made to bake or hopefully doing some scratch cooking in there. Do you have the available equipment like knives and cutting boards, mandolins to properly chop the vegetables? Do you have the amount of personnel needed to do those things? Um, does, is your staff skilled? Have they been trained in knife skills, things that they might need to, uh, to prepare fruits and vegetables or other meal uh, components? Um, how much time, depending on the size of your a kitchen or what type of operation, if you do a central kitchen versus each individual kitchen, do you have time to prepare these needed menu items? Um, these are all great things to consider when putting your menu together. Um, and as we all know, no matter what you do, if the students won't eat it, um, I wouldn't say you're wasting your time, but uh, it, it definitely hurts the morale of, of staff and it kind of goes against what we're trying to do, which is to get them to consume uh, healthier meals. And part of that acceptance, uh, especially if you're in a diverse uh, school district or area of Texas, having cultural preferences, um, getting foods in there that students uh, recognize or are used to, um, that goes a long way for participation. Uh, something else that uh, people don't realize, like also throwing in those cultural preferences is great for one group, and also for the group that may be not as aware of that cultural um, food from that region, they may learn something new and try um, try something new that they you know they've just never been exposed to. Also, stimulate the conversations between students about where that comes from in their culture. So, it's just something to consider when you're putting menus together. Um, and then you have to. Um, just actually talk about the menu items. Is it scalable? Do we have the labor? Um, can we actually get this in fresh? Um, how many deliveries can we get in a week? Is our producer able to, to bring that to us when we need it? And those are conversations you'll definitely need to have with whether it's a food hub, an individual farmer or distributor, uh, making sure you have what you need when you need it. Um, we always talk about that when we in the farm to school discussions um, that both sides really need to have that conversation very quickly um, when you get together because if you can't make that happen most of the other stuff's not going to fall in place for you either um, and always menu cycles um, these streamline procurement save time increase the quality of the food that you're preparing and serving um, so like I said, there's a lot of things that, uh, it's just not what you're serving to the kids that all these things are on the back end that you must do, which, you know, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir with that, but these are certainly things when you're, when you're doing menu planning and seasonality that all need to be, um, incorporated in your thought process and your planning processes, um, and how, and your execution of these seasonal menus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, talk a little bit about seasonality. Uh, Lillian brought up the seasonality wheel. Um, it's actually interactive online. It's static here, but if you want to go to square meals, you can actually click on a, on the right there. You can see the particular fruits and vegetables that are listed. Uh, if you hit that grapefruit, it's going to light up all the months of grapefruits available in Texas. Uh, you can search it that way, but if you want to just do click on a particular month, say January, all the things that should be available in Texas. And may, they may not be available in your region, but they should be available in Texas when that particular month. And also if you see the map in the center, um, when you click on a particular vegetable, it will show you the predominant regions that the, that particular fruit or vegetable is grown. So this is a great resource to uh, have. We also have these that we give away a lot um, in actually a paper form that can be given out to students and they can they can actually play with it. But this one's interactive online so that you can uh, use that as a resource. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
And here we have just a few of the other resources that we have uh, online. If any of you are coming to Megacon, we'll probably have some in hard copy uh, that you can take with you. Uh, the Meal Appeal Toolkit. Oh, and these are all on squaremeals.org. Uh, so you can find them there and uh, print them out. And there's also some other resources on there that you'll find in the same section. Uh, the Meal Appeal Toolkit is great resources for making meals um, that visually and also tastefully uh, appeal to children. Um, so that's always great. And one of my favorites is the seasonal cookbook, uh, Cooking with the Seasons. Um, we don't have too many of those in hard copy left, but they are available for print online. Uh, so definitely check that out. And also sign up for our eHarvest newsletter. Uh, we, each month we send this out. It contains a list of uh, new farmers that have signed up for the Farm Fresh Network. It also contains recipes um, and just helpful tips, um, a letter, um, a statement from our commissioner, um, just updates on anything farm to school. So it's a great once a month little resource for you where we introduce new things. Uh, next slide, please. And I mentioned outside of TDA, there's tons and tons of resources out there. One of my favorites, Institute for Child Nutrition. Um, they have a recipe site, uh, the Child Nutrition Recipe Box uh, has standardized recipes from USDA in there. And they also have a lot of webinars. Um, that includes a lot of farm to school material, uh, scratch cooking recipes, um, videos on how to use kitchen equipment and fruit slicers and knives, uh, how to keep produce fresh. So absolutely check out uh, ICN's uh, resources for a plethora of videos and recipes uh, to help you through the process. Um, as I say, with all my, my presentations, there's no reason, reason to reinvent the wheel. So this is something that saves you time and resources and headaches. By all means, please, please use these resources. And if there's something that you don't see out there that you need, please contact us and we can either, if it's out there, we'll try to find it. We may have it, or maybe we can develop it for you. So thank you all very much for all you do in the farm to school space. We really do appreciate it. I know sometimes it seems like a slow process and I can honestly say that's not a bad thing. Um, but you'll look up one day and you'll be like Florence, you'll be 26% of your um, meal products being from Texas and you'll be where you wanna be. So again, thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Florence ISD and for SFC for putting this together. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Michael. And also thank you to Megan who, Megan who was uh, also in you know, participating in the in the planning of this session. Before we transition to question and answer, I want to again invite everyone to go and check the resource document. Uh, there is there is good information there, and we want to build this together. Every voice is important, and um, we want to do uh, some uh, specific questions to to Lillian and Michael. So, if you have any question, please use the chat. I also have a couple of questions to start the conversation for both of you, uh, Michael and Lillian. How do you tell the story of seasonal planning to your administration or the school community members? So basically, how do you share this, this passion of planning, uh, seasonal planning? So I am very fortunate and my administration is really um, supportive um, and kind of as long as I make the numbers work and I make the school look good, they kind of stay, they don't bother me a whole lot. So um, I'm very lucky about that. They, um, we do a lot of social media. We also do a lot of um, in-house advertising. We really don't prepare anything that the kids won't that we won't offer to the kids but we do often prepare items with adults in mind um so like for example today it was loaded baked potatoes versus pizza um so the kids could have a baked potato loaded their way but we sent out emails to you know the adult the staff that that what we had and you see a lot of people that will come down here for a baked potato that we might not have seen for a slice of school pizza 
Um, so that that's pretty much it is we just kind of try to tell people the great things that we're doing and um, and they kind of buy into it. Thank you, Lillian. I have also a question for for Michael. Michael, so you were uh, in the farmer side too. So you understand also this other side of the worst uh, of the work. Um, so what were the questions you have to learn to ask? What should schools keep in mind when talking with farmers? Uh, the main question, like I mentioned in the presentation is, you know, what do you grow? When do you grow it? How can I get it? Um, Cause there may be multiple ways you can get it. And can I get it when I need it? Um, you know, if you're getting it direct from a farmer and he's too busy during the week to deliver, he can only deliver on Saturdays when no one's there, things aren't going to work out so well. Um, but yeah, I would start out with those questions, um, just making sure you're on the same page. And once you realize you're on the same page, then you can start to sort of work on those timelines of how to how far out in advance does a farmer need to know what you want and you know, how far in advance will you need to know what the farmer is going to have? So have that conversation next so to make sure your timelines are in sync and then work from there. Thank you so much. Um, Lillian, um, if I can ask you another question, uh, where do you get ideas for recipes that you could use? Uh, you unusual ingredients or so new ingredients that are local and are on season. Do you have any specific resource that you go and check recipes? Well, we have a lot of recipes on our nutrition software page. Um, they've done a good job of uploading. Um, there's some schools out there doing some amazing things. ICN has a great recipe box. Um, I use that quite a bit. A lot of times what we do is we uh, go out and we see what the kids are eating at the restaurant and we come back and try to make those fit schools. I mean, almost almost every restaurant you go to now has some version of that strawberry salad with the balsamic vinegar. So we just try to, you know, make it fit into what we need. Um, the, we've really noticed that the kids are paying attention to things like the quality of the meat. So instead of um, instead of using our our pounds for those uh, pre those preformed and breaded chicken sandwiches, we're, we're kind of going ahead and investing in a lot of the whole muscle meat because we're really competing against Chick Fil A, right? And then you can just divert those dark pounds to other things. Uh, we do a lot of the meatballs and that sort of thing. Um, but we're we just we're trying to improve the quality as much as we can. Um, and, you know, when I'm coaching my staff, knowing that knowing that those kids don't take everything they're entitled to, I feel like as long as nothing's going in the trash can for waste, as far as on our end, there's not much that we cannot feed those kids and stay within the, the financial guidelines. Um, so. And also knowing you can offer a more expensive or nicer type entree because we still know that if you're putting it up against a, a, a slice of pizza or a hamburger, they're, they're probably going to go for that as opposed to the pork roast and gravy over mashed potatoes and that sort of a thing. So, Thank you so much, Lillian. We have another question for you. Uh, <clears throat> Hernán, do you mind to read your question, please? Hernán is also part of SFC. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to introduce yourself, Hernán. Hey, everyone. I was trying to talk earlier, and my phone was on mute, but my computer wasn't. Anyway, it can get a little confusing. So hi, everybody. My name is Hernán Colmenero. I'm super glad to be here on this call and meet virtually all of you, even though I can only see a few of us. But yeah, thank you for having me. I am joining SFC. Yesterday was my first official day uh, as the farm to institution manager. So I'll be very involved with 
this sort of work uh, with school nutrition um, and other institutions. And so Lillian, that was a great presentation. I want to ask, how do you institutionalize these practices that you're doing? Because it sounds amazing, but uh, I, I, I can't see you. I, I, like how do you, if, if a CMP director such as yourself is moving on to better things, how do you make that a standard practice so that it's not contingent or dependent on that one person to advocate and to make this happen? And it really becomes a school, uh, a school priority that's happening regardless of that person being there or not. How do you, how do you suggest we make that happen? Well, it's interesting because I think Callie and I just before the meeting we're talking about that um, about we I have a meeting with um, was it the tell me Callie the regional USDA regional office on Thursday talking about the procurement piece of this um, and that it's still it's still in the works. I went into this project with SFC hoping to come out with some with a notebook of procurement for small time farmers. And obviously it's still a, it's, we're still working on making that a reality. Um, but you, you know, you, you're still gonna have your recipes. Um, and so we've got really good uh, nutritional software that we kind of pluck those recipes in and it comes out on the other end. It needs less of this or more of that. Um, and so once you get that kind of tweaked, then as far as institutionalizing the recipes, they're already in there. Um, and so anybody on my staff can access those. Um, as far as the as the the processes for getting the stuff here, it's a it's it's multiple avenues. So there's the ones that are already like stamped and approved because we've gone through the co-op and gone out for bid and we can get these things from Labatt or get these things from Brothers. Um, and then of course with the, on the USDA food side of it, that, that's a good resource too. So to me, the weak link is still that, how do you get the farmer from up the road to bring his, you know, two bushels of, of carrots in or his tomatoes or whatever he's got. We are still small enough to where we fly underneath that micro purchase uh, radar. So we are able, you know, we just document the purchases, um, you know, why we're purchasing it. Uh, I just went through my audit and it, we got, we did okay. We did better than okay on the procurement piece of it. I don't know how it would have looked if we were in the, you know, $50,000 range uh, for local, but um, hopefully I can see the people that are on this call <laughs> who have that who have that vision as well. And so I just I think by putting out the fact that I don't I don't know how to make it bigger and make it more institutionalized that you know the people that are in on the policy and and that sort of thing can help. So just as a quick follow up, thank you. Uh, what's your student population at Florence ISD? Just from my own. What is my student population? Oh, we're, we're, we're floating right around 1,200 kids right now, but uh, we're getting a new elementary school and we're, we're expecting double digit growth year over year forever out here because we're kind of north of Georgetown, south of Colleen, and there's nowhere for those places. They're coming. We get water out here, we're going to blow up. So <laughs> that's our big that's our big sticking point right now. I love the description, Lillian. Yes. <laughs> Ryan, I know that, I mean, your district is 20% currently uh, sourcing locally, and I want to cheer that main or district. So I don't know if you have any comment. I don't want to catch you uh, maybe busy, but you, you have been doing so much work too, Ryan. So at any point, if you want to share and jump, uh, please feel welcome. Um, I do have a question for Michael. And um, so Michael, uh, we are in this presentation, we're trying to share resources for anyone who is looking to start this or is already in the process of bringing more local uh, food in, in the daily life of, of, of the students. So one of the questions that we have is how can we make a value of this, like additional value in the in the school community? And the specific question that I have for you, in your opinion, how can we qualify 
uh, quantify the, the impact of this type of planning or purchasing. May I come in on something Lillian said earlier? That yes, of course. Um, she had mentioned that they flew under the radar of the micro purchase. Um, actually, I realized this at our ESC winter meeting. People were asking, and I know that you all go through these audits every year um, or however often they are. Um, and a lot of people do not buy some local products because they're not sure of how to document it. So we're actually working with our compliance people, the people who do those audits, to try to figure out a way that we can provide a resource to the schools. So when they when they do their procurement process for local foods, once they you know go through their procurement audit, they have the proper forms available or the proper documentation. So we're sort of working We've been working forward from just procuring, but we're kind of working backwards from the compliance side of it now to try to make those two meet so that uh, child nutrition directors can feel comfortable buying local and feel that they will meet all the documentation requirements when they do have those audits. So I just want to say, hang on, and hopefully we'll get something out there soon so that uh, it'll make that part of the process a lot easier. Or you'll feel a lot more comfortable, especially when you get into those larger purchases that you're doing it correctly, and you'll have everything you need when, when the time comes for your for your audit. So, um, how can we quantify this? Um, I actually do have numbers, but they're in another um, slide. So I just, in general, I would say just know that. Every time you buy a Texas grapefruit rather than one from say California or Florida, um, you're supporting a Texas business. You could be supporting a neighbor. You could be supporting a parent of one of your students. Um, spending local just really keeps these dollars circulating uh, for a lot of these school districts in these in some very small communities. Um, and that and that's the way I, I think it really sells itself. It's just in the fact of neighbors and communities doing business with each other and for each other for the betterment of the community. Thank you, Michael. So we're very close to wrap up. I would love to ask um, any other comment uh, from uh, Candy or Ryan or anyone who has a question, please feel free to jump in the conversation. We know that we know that it's uh, Tuesday and feels like Thursday and it's five, <laughs> five o'clock, getting close. So I would when, like to yes, please. I, I, I'd like to say that one of the large biggest problems I find when I'm talking to other directors about going local, buying local things, again comes back to the whole procurement. They're afraid. They, there's not like a set process out there. And so they're afraid to go and go out and start purchasing from a local vendor that's not one of their general suppliers and things like that. And so I know a lot of them tell me how that really scares them and they worry about, I'm at a baseball game, so I had to walk away. Uh, so they're really uh, concerned about that and that's why they don't do it. Uh, they all want to do it. They just need some, it's basically, I think a lot of times and Lillian will probably agree with me. It's a, like a lot of them would like a one, two, three step. You know, what do I do first to go about doing this? What's the next step I take? What's the next step? Uh, just because they want to do it right, but they want to do more local. Does that make sense? So I think that's one of the biggest problems to start with before they'll even look for someone local is they want to know more about how to procure and that they're doing the right thing as far as TDA feels like the process is. Um, as, as far as the procurement process, there's really no difference as far as 
if you're going to buy $70,000 worth of chicken, it doesn't matter if you buy it from your the person down the street or two counties over or whoever you might buy it from. So you can like, as far as like the procurement rules, um, and then I know that sounds weird, but it, it really is true. I mean, the procurement rules are from USDA and then some of them from us. Um, so you have to treat it just like you're procuring anything else. But there are ways when you're procuring local um, that you can use geographic preference and some other methods um, to make sure that you're honing in on the local products. But I do understand your frustration, and I hadn't really thought about that until I went to that ESC um, winter meeting and people were asking questions. And I was like, wow, I think a lot of these people are not buying local because they don't know if they're doing it right in the eyes of TDA. So we're now trying to backtrack that. And it's like, what does that look like? What do we want to see when TDA comes in? Like, what what is I I don't do I'm, that's not my forte. So now we're talking to the people who actually do those audits. It's like what are you looking for? What meets the requirements? What can we provide to these CEs to have them fill out the QDA is happy with, so everyone feels comfortable with the whole process. So yeah, that's what I was mentioning that we're we are working on that and realized that that was a very very big issue from pe for people to step into the uh, the local procurement. So. We hear you, and uh, we are definitely, definitely working on that process. So, hang in there. <laughs> well, my myself and Lillian are two that we're not afraid of those those things. So we're not we're not afraid to jump in there and do that. But it's hard to explain to a lot of our colleagues that sure. it's okay to do that and how to do it. And so I think a lot of it is if there was like even a one pager that described how do you do this, you know. How, what what steps do you take? Kind of like a uh, a step process. Okay, sure. you find a vendor. Here's what you do. Here's what you do step by step. Because a lot are not not as brave as we are to want to tra do changes and try new things. So, like I said, I think a lot of it just comes down when I'm trying to explain it to them. They want more concrete ABC. I agree Does with that. Makes sense. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. One. And especially for someone who's new to it. Yeah. You know, someone's been doing it a while. Like, um, I don't know some of y'all personally, but I know Ryan, like Ryan's been doing this for a while. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he, he's a, an old hand at it, even though he's a young guy, he's been doing it a while. Um, it's not, but a, you, but for you someone new, some, yeah, I do. I do yeah. You understand, you know, most of them, this is a new world. They have sure. never bought anything from anyone but an approved vendor from a co-op <laughs> or a, an approved vendor in sorts. Uh, their district is like, oh, wait, they're not an approved vendor. Things like that. So this is a new world for them. So sure. I really think it'd be great to, to make them feel a little more comfortable. We're, we're working on that. And I would also say one a very quick, easy workaround is to try to buy um through like Labatt Brothers, uh, Hardee's, um, someone who is bringing in local vegetables, uh, someone that you're getting your other stuff from. So it can be already part of your bid process, but they are providing you, you know, you're already buying lettuce from them. They probably have local lettuce farms that they're buying from. So always check with them too. They can help you through this so that you're not doing a separate procurement process. You can just buy from your big mainline distributor or whatever it is. So that's that's a that's a quick fix, but I understand we're working on the other the other part of it too. So we have here Lucille who wanna say something too. Welcome Lucille. Hi everybody. Thank you all so much. Um Lillian, thank you for your presentation. It was it's really awesome and interesting. And I just want to say from a vendor perspective perspective. My name is Lucille Contreras and I'm the CEO and founder of Texas Tribal Buffalo Project. We raise bison and we're hoping to become vendors in the farm to school, um, you know, group communities in Texas. I live centrally located 
and the same type of uh, hesitation and things that y'all mentioned on the school side, we as vendors or myself um, definitely experience also. And I'm really excited to hear about all of these different programs. And I'm really looking forward to looking through all the resources. And I just hope to be able to uh, get to know you all more better and um, introduce to you this beautiful, delicious bison meat, which is talk about like cultural awareness uh, as a Texas indigenous woman, I hope to bring that to the schools in Texas. Thank you guys for inviting me and for hosting this SFC. I, I love you all very much. And it's so cool to see that uh, Hernan has joined y'all's group. So thank y'all. Thanks, Lucille. Um, it's, it's great to see you. I know we're coming up on time here. Um, really quick before we close out, I just wanted to um, note, Michael talked a little bit about solicitations and local preference. I'm going to include in the um, resources some guidance documents, or not, not guidance documents, but some toolkits that were put together by the Center for Good Food Purchasing and by Common Market on how to manage costs and how to add those, those local preference, those local preferences um, into your uh, grade or your scoring guidelines um, and into your uh, RFPs. So those are really, really helpful if you're interested in learning more. Reach out to me or someone else at SFC. We would love to talk to you more about your local sourcing. Um, Saidi, do you want to close this out? Yes, of course. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, to share your ideas. I know that Ariana has a, a question and, uh, and there was more comments there. If you are inspired by what our speakers are bringing today, please consider to start um, working more close with us. I mean, the, Hernan and myself, we're um, going to be more dedicated to the Learning Collaborative um, Ambassador Program. So if you feel called to work, uh, more in, in creating this movement as, as some of you say that, you know, it could be a little bit um, difficult to take the decision. We're here as a group to really like offer some resources, but at the end of the day, we want you to lead the process. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, please share um, your ideas in the Google group or reach to Hernan and to myself or to Holly. And after this, after we conclude this, we're gonna have a survey. And it is very important your feedback. This is the last session that we're doing for this uh, school year. So it will be very, very significant to have your comments. Please complete the survey if you have a chance. Thank you so much. And a whole Lucille, thank you for being here. Hasta luego.